Hello, how are you doing? Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Okay, so it's five o'clock. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, just a quick announcement. I shared a job opportunity in your Canvas announcement. So if you want to apply for that, you can. Um, it's a company in Orange County that's looking for students in computer science to provide some service in a various area, development, IT, and so on. So you will find the link information. Let me show you what that looks like. Hold on one second. Okay, so if you click the link, it's going to look like this. If you're interested in applying, right, you can fill this out. Um, and then I think they have some assessment questions. And then you can go through that and answer the questions to see if you can get selected. Okay. So for that, you can take a look at your Canvas in the announcement. Sorry, my network is a connection is a little slow today. And I've put that in this afternoon so you can find that here. Okay. Okay, so let's let me close my other course information. Okay, we don't have too much to do today. I'm gonna talk a little bit about the course project um afterwards. So we only have to do one program. Applying Amdahl's law. So for lap nine, um, we you can use your IDE um, if you use your virtual machine. Before you start your virtual machine, you need to enable multiple CPU, and I'll walk you through that. So in this week, we are going to use um, Python to write a program that has sequential and parallel components. We are going to do a merge sort and search algorithm. So we are going to do a merge sort. And on here, we would, um, if you're using your virtual machine, you can enable multiprocessor. And we would write a, a worker pool um, in, in the program to be able to do the sort. So for, To start, if you're using your Linux virtual machine, before you start your virtual machine, you need to click on machine, go to setting, or you can click the setting wheel in virtual box. <clears throat> and this will take you to your general system information. So if you click the setting tab, you can increase your processor core. So right now I have it as four core. You saw this last week. And then if you want it to respond a little bit more, if you have more RAM, you can go ahead and change that. So right now I give it two gigs and that should be okay. So two gig and up should be all right. Okay. So before you start your virtual machine, you would need to do that. Then um, locate your virtual machine and you will be able to boot it. Oh, is it? Oh yeah, sorry, I forgot to change that from the last time I taught it because I had um I had like a meeting, a conference that I I must attend it last last time. So sorry if if that's confusing to you. I will make sure I'm, I'll edit that. Okay. Yeah, next week um there's something going on on Wednesday that I won't be able to hold regular class, but it won't impact your class. Yeah, we have advisory committee meeting once a semester. Um, and so usually the faculty for the program has to attend to meet with the employers and, and other entities. So that was why it shows that. 
Okay, so once I start my virtual machine and it boots, um, what I will do is, again, I would use nano, so you can use your command line to be able to create your file. And in this one, we are going to do a merge sort. So the way merge sort works is it's going to break your container of values into two at first. And then um, it's going to do the comparison. So when you look at the code, you, you need to think about mechanically what it's doing um, with the container of values. So <clears throat> when you write this program, what you're going to see is that we are going to implement features and we are going to make sure that we um, add in our process pool executor. This will allow us to create a pool of workers. And when we talked about this last week, ask complete is a method or a function that comes from the um, library. Then we're going to import in our multiprocessing. And this one, you don't need to install additional module um, on your IDE or on your Linux machine because it comes with Python. We're going to import time. So the sequential part is going to be um, the beginning. So I have a, a function. This is going to be a sequential sum. And it's going to have low and high. So we're passing these parameters. And they are variables. Then we're going to return the sum. And we're going to use range that's nested inside the sum function or method. <clears throat> Then the second part of the program, which holds the majority of the uh, program functionality, is going to be your parallel. And recall that we are talking about Amdahl's this week, so we want to look at how the parallel implementation could possibly improve our program. So we want to do an estimate with Amdahl's law. So in the parallel implementation, we have a function called parsum. This is going to be for our parallel. And <clears throat> we are going to have the low high for our parameter for the sum function. And then for the pool, we want to specify none. Now, in the next statement, it says, if not pool, we are going to have the width statement. We are going to use the process pool executor to ask executor and we're going to implement define our futures object. So our futures object is going to store the sum of low and high um, from the pool. So it's going to call on this function after it's um, returned. So in itself, if you think about that, it is recursive, right? A function that calls itself. So here, that's going to be for futures. Then we're going to also call on the sum method. So we're going to return sum, and we're going to append the results. And we're going to use the ask completed to implement the futures, which is going to be our coroutines. Um, so that way, each of the processor is going to be able to execute the process, each process as it's going to um, compare and identify your values. Then we would implement the, um, for, for the, the condition of how, uh, that this is going to be our base case. So we would say if high subtract low is less than or equal to 10,000, right, we would return and we want to append that into a list so that would it, you would use you would need to use submit and you would need to bring in what you had stated before which is you're going to be your sum of your range low and high else we're going to have to identify the middle where that's going to be divided so where it's going to split the index so your mid is going to be high plus low divided by two now remember that we have a container of value, we want to segment that to the left and the right side, right? Because it is a sort. So the lower end is going to be on the left. The higher end is going to be on the right. 
So as it's looking at the numbers, right? Uh, so if let's say I have a high number, then it's going to put on the right side, whereas the low number, it's going to be on the left. So with that, we would need to really define like where that middle and low would be. That's going to be on our left side. And the right side is going to be the high from the middle to the higher range values to the right. So therefore, we would need to define what left is. And for left, we are going to call parsem. And that's going to be from low to middle. And that's going to use pull is pull because the, the way that we do this is we also need to subdivide the processes, right? That's going to evaluate those values um, as we assign multiple core to this. On the right-hand side, we are going to go from middle to high, which is going to define the higher range of our sort container. Then we're going to call the parsum method. And very similar to this, the only difference is going to be going to go from mid to high. So pull is pull. And we're going to return left and right because that's going to give us the complete um, sorted container. Then we have the main section. And so here's our main. If namespace is main, we are going to have the, the num evals run that's going to be equal to one or some value is going to be this value. Now, once those are defined, we are going to put in some of the, the print functionality. So we want to show that it is going to evaluate the sequential implementation. That's the first part of your program. And the result from that, right, that's the, the the beginning part of the program there. And then your se sequential time is initialized at zero. So here is where you would pass the sum value, which is this. OK. And then we want to be able to loop it. So for i in range, and now it's going to access the index of the container, which each of the element is then being evaluated, num evals run. So, and we initialized that previously at one. We're going to start our clock. And this is slightly different than what you've seen in the past where you would have the time function. But in this one, we want to have the performance counter. So it's going to give us a little bit more details, right? Performance counter as a function incorporated additional assessment in um, efficiency and so on. Then. We are going to have the sequential, and we are going to also pass a sum value, which we had defined previously, and that was also used in the parameter in the previous for sequential result. So our sequential sum, this is the function that we defined at the beginning. We call on that function, and we want to pass the sum value, starting with 1, and it's going to end in at at um, 100,000 uh, or 100 million, OK? And then, um, so this is going to sum up your sequential values or the values that were produced from the sequential portion of your code. Then we want to measure the time for the execution for the sequential part of our program. And we want to take the sequential time it's going to divide it by the number of evaluation runs. So as it loops through and it access each of the element, we want to look at the time for that. OK, then for the print in the parallel, similar to what you've seen in the last part, in this one, we're going to have parallel result. That's going to store the output, right? That's going to be your parsum, which is your function that you define for the parallel portion. It's going to start at 1, and it's going to go to the end value, which is 100 million. Um, then initialize the parallel time at 0. Then we're going to start the loop as we have the 4i in range. So it's going to access the index for each of the value in um, from 1 to 
from one to the end of your container, it's gonna start the clock. Then we're gonna call the parsem and we are going to uh, obtain the output. So here's where you call the function starting at one and go to the 100 million. We're gonna find the parallel time. And as it does that, it's gonna look at individual process execution. So it's gonna measure the performance, subtract the start, which gives you the overall time for execution. And then it's gonna evaluate the time for each round, okay? Then the last part, it says that if sequential result is not the same as parallel result, it's gonna raise the exception and it's gonna display the string sequential result and parallel result do not match if they're not the same. Then it's gonna print out your average sequential time. Now keep in mind that when you do analysis, we a lot of the time don't look at the average, we actually look at the worst case scenario but for the sake of this exercise, we want to look at the average sequential time to compare to the average parallel time. So in real, in real world analysis, you would look at the worst case scenario, the slowest time for sequential time compared to the slowest time for the parallel time, okay? Then we want to have the format for our seconds or um, your microsecond, so it's going to be our sequential time, multiply it by uh, the thousand, which is your millisecond. Then your average parallel time, again, we're going to format it to show. Then our speed up. So the speed up, we simply take the sequential time divided by the parallel time. So in earlier labs, we already started doing this, right? When we're looking at the speed up, when we take the division. So Ultimately, you would have the sequential time that was measured in our program divided by the parallel time. And it's gonna give you the ratio as a speed up. Then we would have the efficiency. So efficiency is gonna be a percentage. So we would take the speed up, times it by the 100, and then divide it by your uh, CPU count. Because whatever the number of cores that you assign, Right, that's going to be so if your system runs, um, you know, 12 cores, then you can you can use that value for your CPU count. OK, and that value was considered as part of the program. So if you run it in a regular IDE, that's what you see. Now, in my virtual machine, I assign it four. So that's the value that's going to be used. OK. So how do I know where to find my CPU information? You can go to your system properties or you can go into your system information for Windows PC, right? And then um, you can use that here. And for those of you who actually are familiar with um, Windows, you can go to control panel and search for that, go to system and then system again, or in settings, it would also share with you the information, right? So what you, you would do is you would be able to find your processor information, your RAM information, and so on, your, your OS information in your system property, okay? Now, you can always also look at your processor model and then be able to also Google that. So there are a lot of ways that you can find your core information. But when the program outputs, it should tell you the, um, we can also do the CPU count to print to show our CPU, like what we've done before. Okay, so let me log in here. So I would go to my terminal by searching for it and I'm using Ubuntu and recall that I had set up my settings, right? If you missed that from earlier and I'm using four core for just my virtual machine. Um, my computer have more cores. Um, so I just wanted to dedicate only four to my VM. Okay, so let me 
I increase the zoom here. Okay. So we're gonna nano in, and I believe we call this um, parallel merge. Dot py. Oh, maybe hold on. I didn't say that the same. I call it merge parallel. Sorry. Okay, so nano merge parallel. Okay. So in nano, you can do shift all shift all three or hash. It's gonna give you the line number to show on nano. I think I put that on the prior labs as well. So shift alt three, then you can type. Right, you can add in the comments for the parallel section, the sequential section, and you would put in your code. Then once we have that, then we would then save. So control X. Now in the next step here, it's going to ask you to run the program. So we simply use Python 3 and then we would call on our file, whatever the name of the file that you use, that's what you're going to put in. So Python 3 merge parallel dot py with the file extension. So it would, then, it would then output, so it shows that it evaluates the first part of my program, sequential, second part of my program is gonna be parallel, and this might take a little bit for it to go. So here's the average time for the sequential, right? And the average time for the parallel, your speed up is 0.41, or for me, and my efficiency is 10.31%. So once I have the output, right, I simply go through and answer the questions. Um, we would take the screenshot for our program code and our output. We would then provide the average sequential time for the merge sort. So we would go back to our here. And so for me, my average time is uh, 1,570.21 milliseconds. So it's going to be this value. For the parallel time, I would also make a note of that because the question asks that. Then I come back here and it shows my speed at my parallel time is the next part. So by just looking at the values, you would see that my parallel is higher. Right, three thousand eight hundred and five and five compared to one thousand five hundred and seventy. So my speed up is going to be point four one, and the efficiency is ten point thirty one percent. So I would put those in my answers. And then we want to put down the number of cores that we use. So in my case, that will be four. Or if you use two core, you can put two core. We don't want to use only one single core, right? Okay. So the sequential time and the parallel time is going to be the total time of my program. So let's find that first. So I can go ahead and open up my calculator. And I have it on scientific mode. You can change your mode there. So I come back to my answer or my output. So my average sequential is 1570.21. So I'm going to go ahead and 70.21. And I'm going to go ahead and add that with my parallel time, which is 3,805.77, 3, 
So this is my total time, which is 5,375.98. So let's copy this real quick. And then we want to find the percentage of parallel. So the percentage, this is my total. So you would get the output value that you see on your screen and then you sum those up. And then my percentage for um, sequential is going to be 1.5. Seven zero twenty one divided by the total times one hundred. Five seven zero point twenty one divided by the total, which is five three seven five ninety eight, and then we want to multiply this by one hundred to get the percentage. So let's see. put this in a calculator. Five three seven five point ninety eight is going to give me about twenty nine point two zero seven. So twenty nine point two oh seven percent. Okay. So after you divide, you multiply it by one hundred and you get the percentage. Then um for the next part we're gonna calculate the parallel percentage. And so for, for, for my parallel, I'm going to come back here, 380577. So we put that in here to show the work. 3805.77 divided by 5375.98. And we want to multiply that by 100 to show the percentage. So you would know that it should be about 70%. So, okay. oh. 0.77 divided by 5375.98. Right, so roughly 70%, so 70.79%. 70 70 Because combined, they are 100%. So now we want to know I have the parallel percentage and the, the sequential percentage. And for the speed up, so the program speed up that it gave me is I just lost the map. Sorry. Uh, ten point thirty one percent. So we want to make a note of that. Ten point thirty one percent. And then you can also refer to your notes for Amdahl's law. Right, so the example that you see is here. So we already have the parallels percentage and the, the sequential percentage. So what we wanna do is we wanna plug that in. So we have the sequential, which is 0.29. Okay, so I'm gonna, let me copy this real quick and replace the value so I don't have to type it into the equation.
Okay, so I have the sequential that's going to be 0.29. We can make it 30, so let's just make it 30, so 0 0.30. And then um, we're going to subtract that by 0 0.30. And I'm using four core. Okay. So the original equation is you're going to take B, which is the sequential, and you're going to plus it by one minus B, which is the sequential percentage. And then divided by J, that's going to be the number of core that you use. So if you're using 12 core, that goes for the J here. So let me clear this out. And then you clear this out. So we can put this into the calculator. So I have um, 0.3 plus 0.7 divided by 4 equals, and then we want to take the ratio of that. So my speed up is about. 2.10 using MDOS equation. Okay. Now here for the efficiency, what you see is for the speed up, it shows me 0 0.41. So you have to see what it's calculating in the actual program. So if you come back to the program, right? Um let me see. So for the speed up, basically they're only using the sequential time divided by the parallel time. They didn't apply the MDOS equation. So when you take the sequential time divided by the parallel time, you should be able to get the speed up that's output in the in the program. Now when we're using MDOS law, it's actually looking at the speed up for the parallelization, right, with the multi-core processor. So it's slightly different than what you would see for the speed up. So let me clarify that part right here in our assignment. Sorry, let me come back to this. So the program speed up is this which is your uh, sequential divided by the parallel percentage. Where MDOS law is gonna be this value, that's gonna be the speed up just for the parallelization. Okay, so we would say that this is now with that, right? The speed up as it is the ratio of the percentage like this, is it gonna match up with what you see? Right, it is going to be different because the consideration in MDOS equation, we actually evaluate it based on multi core. Where if you're looking at the speed up like this, right, we are really not factoring in the how many cores that we're using for the processes. So it is going to be a little different than what you would see. So the output of the program, it tells us 10.31%. That is just a general speed up, not considering <clears throat> the multi-core um, factor, right? Whereas MDOS law, we were looking at the speed up specifically for parallelism for that part of the, the program and to be able to look at the number of core that we're using as part of the estimate. Okay, and that's the true difference, I think, is the general... Um, estimate for the speed up by just doing the ratio 
um, that gives you a general idea, but I don't think that it would look at the specific on how, what kind of improvement that you're looking at specifically for parallel uh, component of your program. Okay. So with that, you should be able to answer this last question, which is I, um, as we compare this to what the program outputs. Any question? Okay. No questions. It's a pretty simple program. Originally, I wanted to do also the search, but we, we will come back and we'll do uh, a search mechanism another time. All right. So once you're done, right, um, what we can do is we can go shut down now on the terminal, and that's going to kill our Linux virtual machine for now. All right, and then we can close. Um, virtual box. Okay, so your lab is not due until Sunday. Um, you have some time. So if you want to test out some of the programs that I, I shared in the lecture, you can. Um, sorry about the delay in the video. I was just bombarded with some stuff. And so I the videos are up now for the lecture. Um, and so if you, and then I will try to post the video for this, but if you subscribe to my YouTube channel, you also have the playlist or you can access the playlist for this particular class, which has last year's stuff on it as well. Okay. So let's come to, uh, sorry. Let me go to the module. I think I didn't publish it yet, but we're going to talk about project now. Do you have any question for me for the lab before we change topic? Okay, so let me change the date for this real quick. Let me publish it so you can see. Um, so as I, I go through the courses, I try to simplify the components and things for my students. Normally I would have like three parts for the project, but you still are gonna require to do some general documentation. Keep in mind that um, the documentation that I ask you to provide is by far a lot less than what you would see at university level. Um, a lot of the university level, they require extensive documentation um, for software development. Um, and then you need to really provide like ex and explain the functionality of your software, the components of your software purpose and so on. OK. So on here, you would find your course project requirement. Um, it is broken into two parts. OK. Part one is going to be the programming piece. That's going to be weighted the most. Um, it is 150 points. I do have a rubric. Okay. Now, um, I'm fine with you writing a program for a specific objective. Um, in this particular class, I don't require that you need to address a certain area or a target in your program. Um, in general, you can think about how this program is going to fulfill some kind of business needs or consumer needs. So if you want to make like some kind of game, right? But you need to think about the scope of your project, how it can be achieved in the next uh, six plus weeks. OK, because it's due during the finals week. And I don't take late project because I do have grades deadline that I need to submit. And some of you are transferring. So I want to make sure that your grades go in um, for your transcript and all of that. OK, so making sure that that happens. Therefore, I don't take extension for late project. 
Um, so this is why we want to have a good amount of time to get started. Um, if you work for a business or if you saw that there is a business problem, so in software development, we always want to implement system and hardware and software to really solve a problem, um, you know, for the business. Um, and, you know, so it could be in any area. So think about what kind of program that you want to write. Um, but you need to implement the components of this class, okay? All right, so <clears throat> you will need to have one or more modules and those could be just your own Python file, right? So you would need to code that to measure your program performance. You saw one today when we did the lab um, where how we would be able to measure um, and you can think about like what areas you want to measure. Um, so you would need to use like time it module. So I would suggest not just to use the library and put that inside your code, like what you've seen in some of the lab exercise, but to write a separate Python file and then import that in. So that way you can modify that file and not having to modify your program down the line. So for example, the first iteration of your program might have specific components before the program for the overall goal of the program. Down the line, version 10 of your program, you might add features and different things to your program, right, to improve it um, in the future, then you would need to maybe also assess the performance of those elements. So it's probably easier to write a separate Python file and make it, you know, accessible to your main program to measure the performance of your program. That is just my recommendation. You don't have to do that. You can still code it in into the program. But the disadvantage of doing the, the actual performance measurement inside the program is in the future, when you add in things, you're going to have to modify a lot of the parts in your program. And somehow that can cause issues, errors, loss, things like that, where if you make it a modular program, you just go to that performance module, performance assessment module, and then modify that, okay, as you modify the, the major functionality of your program. So modular design allows you to scale a little bit more seamlessly, especially when you're thinking about like the growth of the business or then, you know, the usage of your program, how this can be integrated um, in the long run and how it can um, improve or um, advance further along. So that would be 20 points. I will look for that, some form of assessment and measurement in the performance. Then um, we every week we have used some form of package or module to really address how we can improve our our program development. So I am gonna look for asynchronous, and this is a pretty broad area. So you can choose on how you want to target this, whether you want to do threads or um, you want to do processes, okay? It's really how you want to design your program to meet the, its needs. So think about the type of program that you want and how asynchronous can elevate your program. All right, so with that, that will be 20 points. Then we want to implement parallel process or multi-threading. So that means I'm going to look for the libraries that you use, right? And then how you implement process pool or thread pools. And to be able, and then if you're handling storage properly, are you using shared memory or are you, are you using distributed memory? And we touched on that, right? The advantages of using shared, the disadvantages of using shared. When using thread, you can use share. When using processes, you have to use distributed memory to optimize your program. Okay, so uh, that will 
touch back on how we apply the concept there. So that's 50 points. And then in the future weeks, we are going to look at how we can reuse the components of our program, right? And then we're also going to implement patterns. So I would look for uh, to see if you integrate patterns as part of your program to reuse the components of your program. So it is a way to efficiently utilize your code and redundant, um, you know, a lot of the things that we do really is a redundant cycle anyways. So if you're able to capitalize on the reusing of the components that really drive the efficiency on how you use your resources, right? Your storage and um, to be able to execute the tasks that you need. Okay, so that will be 20 points. And then for some part of your program, there will be a documentation and I do have a, a template or like some kind of guide for you to use. So you're gonna use the documentation guide and then you need to provide me with like a brief and you know, like a one page, two pager of your project information. So that gives me a general idea of what you're trying to target, what kind of things you're trying to achieve in your program and so on. Now for, you know, when I did this previously um, in this same class last year, right? The majority of the students that took the class, they are cybersecurity students. Um, so they, some of them chose to use, you know, this project to write like a, a pen test tool to be able to, you know, do something, for example, like brute force or, um, you know, attack a server and so on. So everybody had a different goal um, in how they wanted to implement this. So you should think about what you want to do um, with this program. And the point in this is to give you a base to build on. So in the future, let's say you go to Cal Poly Pomona, UCI, or another core, or take any additional advanced classes, you already have some of the foundation for Python. And if you want to do a Python project or a software engineering class or whatever, um, you're capable of just building on it, maybe adding database, um, you know, so when I give you feedback, when I test your program and look at your program, I will highlight some of the things that you did well and then some of the areas that you need to grow um, and then, you know, give you some suggestion on how you can implement new, you know, uh, components and features in your program to scale it out for real world practices and also, you know, for future projects. OK, so altogether, this is 150 points. Then um, the second part of this is you are going to put it on GitHub, okay? And then we are going to use a Google form to do evaluation. So I suggest that we would do this later on, right? Work on the programming part first and try to do it in pieces. So a lot of the students feedback in all my classes for programming is that a lot of them fail to deliver the project because they wait till the last week or two weeks to work on it. And they found out that it's a lot more work than what it seems. So they don't have the complete project, okay? They still turn in whatever they had for some credits. Um, and I try to look at what you, you know, a student put to be able to give the credit, but it won't be very high because there was nothing, right? At university level, it is not acceptable to turn an incomplete project, right? Usually that's just an automatic zero or an F anyways, okay? But I do give partial credit. So in the case that if, you know, things don't work out like how you plan, you should still submit it so I can see what you worked on and, you know, give you some pointers on how to fix some of the things that you have come across that you couldn't fix, for example. Um, but, you know, if everything works out well, right, that's great. Um, that will work. That will be good for you. Okay, so GitHub, um, we need to make a repo, post our code. I will also expect a readme page. And README uses HTML, so when you put stuff on there, 
keep in mind that you you would need to lightly program it in HTML. Otherwise, it's just going to be one long sentence across, right? There's no break in the sentence and the paragraph. Um, there is tutorial for how to create a good readme through GitHub and other sources. Um, so I provided some of the link for you to use. Don't just put the project title on there and then call it a readme, right? A readme should have your general program information, its version, who creates it, so your name, right? And then instructions on how to use it. Um, if you ever see GitHub stuff for Linux or libraries, like we've been looking at some of those, right? They also show you how to install the program, how to, you know, use the program. So if you have general information on how to run the program, you should include it on your readme. Okay, and then another part of it is just to do a self-evaluation. This is just a way for me to see like what your perspective of the project was before you start and what you gain um, at the end. And through the assessment, a lot of the time student, they realize a lot of the things and then the type of lesson that or things that we've learned along the way, uh, sometime that needs that reflection point to really look back and say, oh, I could have done this a little differently. And I myself, I do that all the time too. I would assess and say, hey, the next time I do this, I would not spend so much time doing this, but to focus on other areas. Okay, so it's a good way to reflect. Um, so all both of these, they are 25 points each. Combined, it will be 50 points. Okay. So if you go to the next part of the project, it's just simply the same thing. Just this is where you would submit. Okay. So the documentation guide, you can download it here. Let me go to my project folder and I can show you what that looks like. Okay. So I need one to two page single space that contains some components of your project, right? Your name, your project information details, uh, what problems are you trying to solve? What solution are you implementing? So if you can be more specific, right? Uh, that would be a plus explanation on your algorithm implementation. So how did you design your program? Um, and what are some of the program objectives? What's your program trying to do? How is it supposed to interact with the user? And I don't require a, a UI for this. So if you don't, you know, don't spend so much time. If you took my class, you probably learn how to put graphical user interface together, like a button and a few other things, scroll bar, checkbox, stuff like that. But those things would only be effective if you write function for them to work and, you know, or, you know, base it on a certain event. Um, so then, you know, if you want to just have the user enter values or whatever, that will be fine, right? So talk about your input output, how the user is supposed to interact with the program. Um, and then how are your uh, concurrency concepts applied, right? What, why did you implement threads or processes? What is it for, um, you know, what are you trying to do with those components? Okay. The types of library and modules that you use. Okay. We've used quite a bit. They're in different areas. And so that will be your choice. Okay. And you would see additional ones in the future as well. Every program would have some form of limitations and limitations could be um, that this program is only going to be uh, for a certain type of users, or this program is going to be limited to a certain number of input, et cetera, right? So test your program and look at its capability and design and see what are the limitations. So identify those. So based on that limitation, what do you recommend for improvement? What would you do in addition to, to make sure that it would be more advanced or improved? So make a note of that. I would require that you do a flowchart or a pseudocode. So pseudocode is simply English, 
right? Uh, list of your program procedure from start to end. Some of the things that I look for in pseudo code and flow chart are your branches, okay? Conditions, um, you know, iterations. Those are a lot of the times I focus on that to make sure because a lot of the students write the program first and then they put together the flow chart and the pseudo code. It's okay to turn in, you know, like a draft of your pseudo code, right? But the point is to give you a base, right? And then expand on it. I prefer that you have the complete pseudo code or flow chart, but make sure that we include the majority of the functionality of the program in these elements, okay? So if you're using flowchart, you can use draw IO. Um, that allows you to be able to, there are a lot of different ones online that are free. You just have to create an account and then it stores your flowchart on the cloud and then you'll be able to download it as a PDF or an image or something like that. So this is gonna be only like 10 points. Um, so this is just to help you start your project. So make sure we work on this first before we start doing the programming. Okay, any question? Okay, so let's come back to here. So the submission for this, I'm gonna, um, let me edit this. Okay, that's right, I had it right. So the program Python files, right? Um, if you want to zip it, you can. I think the module is locked. Oh, because I click edit. Let me double check and see. Oh, I'm sorry. I thought I turned it on publish. It shows lock for you. Or oh, maybe the assignment says, let me see, let me let me enable the availability date a little different for you, for everyone, okay? Yeah, I put it on the 31st, so let's, let's turn it on for today. Okay, so let's do that. And then let me also make the other ones available starting today. Okay, so um, for the second part, you you have some GitHub uh, link information on how to use GitHub, um, and then for you're welcome for the evaluation, you would just then use the link and then fill out the form and be able to submit it. Okay, it's not too long. It's like a few questions, less than 10 questions, and then it's in Google form. So I'll be able to see your, your input there. Okay, so I would use the rubric when I grade, and then I would add the comment for you. Uh, once all your grade is done, I will notify everybody in class that I submitted. And I also use matching systems. So once you complete the class successfully, you receive a batch for the class. You can use that to share um, on LinkedIn and other social media um, to showcase your skill for work and so on, okay? So only two parts for the project. Um, and then near the end, I will do final review to go over all the concepts we talked about um, throughout the year. Uh, and that final review is gonna be useful when you take the final exam. Okay, so final exam is going to be open on Canvas at the beginning of the week, and it's going to close um, by the end of the course date. I think we close the class on Thursday um, of that week, the second week of December. So I will remind everyone to access the final exam. So I'll send out the notification for that. Okay, any question? Okay, so 
but um, let me stop recording.